Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hey everyone, B1B Flyer here. This video is the second part of how I painted this Jade Falcon Guards Timberwolf. If you haven't watched the first video, I'll have it linked in the description below and at the end of the video. This is where I left off in part 1, setting the base colors and contrast shading for the brown and green fade. You can see a few areas in the lower foot and ankle area that I needed to get back to and touch up with some contrast or another dark color. Again, I'm using the Alpha Strike card artwork as my guide, and will now move into the more intermediate techniques involving oil paints and weathering. Here's what I used for paints, brushes, and tools. I'm using Rust-Oleum Gloss Clear Enamel, Artist Grade Odorless Mineral Spirits, a glass jar or metal dish, cotton or synthetic swabs, MIG Oil Brushers Buff and Olive Green Colors, a Soft Bristle Eye Makeup Brush, Viejo Model Color Gunmetal Gray and Sky Gray, Game Colors Earth and Extra Opaque Charcoal, a piece of small cell foam, tweezers, a zero synthetic detail, and a number two small dry brush. I'm ready to start highlighting with oil paints. I've shaken these two paints well to mix and place some of each in my palette paper. These tend to be fairly thin from the bottle and are usually close to a workable consistency, but if they're too thick or you're using traditional artist oils, which will be much thicker than these, thinning with odorless mineral spirits, or OMS, will be necessary. I'm using a short bristle, soft makeup brush, and I'll start by loading my brush with a buff color first. The approach I'll use is very similar in the way that I'll dry brush an acrylic. Keep in mind that once you use a brush for oil paints, it should never be used for acrylics again. I want the more wet paint off the bristles, so I'm going to use a paper towel and brush a good amount off. Using the areas that are already highlighted from the dry brushing steps, I'm going to focus on those areas first when I start to apply the paint. They'll act as my guide showing me the areas I want the brightest. I'm going to use a light touch to apply the paint, and right off the bat you can see I probably had a little too much still on the bristles. That's okay though, I'll still be able to work with that. I'm just going to go and start applying a little bit more in some of the other areas and I'll come back to it later. If this happens to you, don't worry. After this section, I'll show you how to remove area oils in certain areas and then you can go back and reestablish some of those. I'm just gonna use a light touch. I'm gonna use brush strokes that end in the direction where I want the highest or brightest area to be. Working on the, the application of the paint is really the initial difficult portion with the oils. You don't wanna just cover the entire panel. You really don't wanna cover more than about three quarters of it and in fact I would recommend even less and then slowly transitioning that paint using the, a brush that's relatively low pigment so that you can pull those smooth blends with the oils which is really the the benefit of using oils in this particular me uh, method so of course I'm gonna aim for those top areas the ones that have already really been established with the dry brushing you don't need a lot of paint there's going to be plenty of pigment remaining on the bristles. It, it doesn't dry out like it will if you were dry brushing, so it's not going to get grainy. You don't have to worry about that caked on, build up type of finish. It's, it's nice to be worry free when it comes to that. But I am still going to apply the paint very similarly as I would with a dry brush. I'm gonna aim for those raised top side edges in certain areas where I'm really not gonna have a lot of real estate to blend much. Now. Of course, if you, as you progress, if you decided to work with oils even more, of course you can go back and you can blend those panels using smaller brushes, but I'm kind of doing a one-stop shop with this brush and, and that's fine. If you want to use something smaller or work a little bit more detailed, please, by all means, that's, that's not a prohibitive activity when it comes to this method. This is just me showing the, the basics, the welcome to oils type of process. I'm gonna hit some of these undersides, but very, very briefly and not as my first few brush strokes after adding some paint. Speaking of which, I just reloaded the brush to hit this outer side and sure enough, there's probably still a little bit too much pigment I had on there, but that's all right. Again, it's not the end of the world. You can, you can go with the flow or you can always come back and, and smooth it out and pull some of that paint away with a clean brush or you can remove some and I'll, again, I'll show you how to do that with OMS. You can see I'm really emphasizing the brush strokes towards the upper area where I want the light to appear as though it's illuminating the panels more. And just reestablishing some of those other areas to get a little bit more uniformity.
the tops of the feet and the toes really would catch a lot of light, and at least in my opinion on this particular model, so I'm gonna go ahead and reinforce those. Pick out whatever details you want to be the brightest, and I think as I discussed when I was talking about the dry brushing portion, once those are established, then you can hit the rest of the model and come back to them and reinforce them again, either by adding more of the same color or you can lighten the pigment as well using either white or lighter tones of whatever color you might be applying. I really want those small areas to just have this the slightest little edge highlight so they don't have to come back and do any of that you know, tedious edge highlight work if you're into that style. Uh, it just looks like it's already been done and that's part of the the benefit of oils is that you kind of get that that freebie highlights that look really good and the dry brush highlights that we've got underneath get blended together so they don't look like dry brushing anymore but they're nice and and strong and contrasting in the rest of the panels because we put a basically a pre-highlight underneath the oils in the areas where it starts to merge together with the browns to the greens i'm going to be much more ginger about the application of the paint i'm not really going to try to put too much pigment there so probably as I've, I've been brushing quite a bit and now I've got very minimal pigment, that's when I'm gonna go in and hit those transition spots. Now I've set the model down and off screen, I'm actually wiping my brush and running it on a paper towel and getting as much of the pigment off because now I want to pull from the areas I want darker up towards the areas where I want brighter to thin out that paint one, one last little bit and make sure that there's going to be a transition from dark to light. Again, it's, it's not gonna be as dramatic, especially on camera like this. Um, also going over a, a lighter color, it, it's not gonna show as much, but if you were maybe going over a darker brown or maybe you didn't do as much dry brushing as I did, you probably would see a more dramatic result. And that's again, to your preference. Now I'm picking out six or seven areas where I really wanna focus on changing the tones of the greens and highlighting. The Olive green is a bit more uh, liquid or thinner than the buff is, so I've kind of got to thicken it by removing it from my brush, if that makes sense. I've put it on and I've dry brushed or treated it like a dry brushing, basically the same thing I did with the buff, but I didn't want to have it uh, streaking on me, so I really need to make sure that I had most of that th uh, thinned paint off of my brush. And now I'm using light brush strokes, really just focusing on the center points of areas. I wanna hit the tops of the missile launchers and the, basically the center point of the center torso and start to establish my base oil highlights. And then I'll work off of these and you'll see as I start to work more and more of the oils and, and play around with the directions that I'm putting the highlights on on the edges, it's going to change the overall hue of the green and that's really what I'm going for. I want a lighter top side and a transition to an intermediate and then darker area where I haven't done anything. You can also use a bit of a stippling motion to apply some of that paint. Just keep in mind you may end up with some pigment in between the recessed areas and you might have to do, you're likely going to have to do some touch up after the oils. But don't be afraid, it'll be fairly minimal compared to if you were applying regular acrylics on or trying to place highlights all over every single panel and try not to keep it in the uh, cracks there. As you start to get more and more familiar with the oils, you'll get more and more comfortable with what they're going to do and then you'll have a expectation as well as an understanding of how they're going to work on your model. I wanna point out right now, I'm touching my model over and over and over again. Normally I don't do that, especially when there's oils on it. I know I've touched several areas that already have oils applied. This is really not what I normally do. It's not a good example, please don't follow it. The reason that I'm doing it is because my model is completely off the base and it's sitting on a paper clip and that acts like a spring. So every time I'd be brushing the model, if I was just holding the base, it would be just vibrating and it would be just completely unwatchable as far as the video is concerned. And I didn't want to do that to all of you. So that being said, uh, I am trying to minimize touching anything that has paint oils applied to it, but just keep in mind that this is really not a good example and I don't normally do this. I'm gonna pick out those last little bits of flat areas on the back and the elbows, and, or well, if you call them elbows, and the torsos just to hit those side edges. 
I don't want to put too much on too quickly, just like I did with the buff. I really want to take my time and just go a little bit at a time and then pick a different area and go a little bit at a time. I, I, if you spend too much time in one spot and you build up the pigment, it's going to start to be much more opaque and it might get to the point where it's a little too much. So it's best to work in small steps and then move on to another area and then assess. Now we're gonna just blend on the palette. I just threw a little bit of buff into my green and now I'm mixing basically a, a, lightened, a lightened olive green with the buff. I'm gonna, again, kind of get the right amount on my brush as I've been working with these paints. I don't want it too thin, so I'm gonna swipe it on my paper towel. And now it's time to start doing more extreme highlights. And this is where I'm just being even more careful with where I'm applying the paint. And by careful, I mean I'm just going in smaller and smaller areas. Working smaller and smaller is kind of the, the theme I'm doing here. You can go in all the directions to hit all the outer edges of the panels. You can go in one direction. It really just depends on the area that you're working on. You'll see me as I apply the paint on the missile launchers. It'll just be for the top halves of the front facings of the missiles. But on the very, very top surfaces, I'm a little more broad with the application because I feel like they would be brighter. I'm kind of pulling out to those front edges because I want those to be highlighted. Pick out what you want and then, you know, gingerly apply that paint and then see what it nets you. And if you have to add a little more highlight, you can. If you need to go a little more green, you can work that in too. This is going to be where you have to kind of experiment and get comfortable with your paints. I also recommend you have either a practice area or some, some other type of, uh, you know, maybe a base or a, a throwaway miniature or something you can practice on to kind of see what your colors are going to do. So that way when you're doing all this hard work on, on your you know, primary paint job, you're not really wondering whether or not it's gonna turn out the way you want it to and you kind of get a bit more understanding of what the result will look like. I'm just going in with just a, a light touch in some of those not often reached areas. Don't wanna forget about those but I probably won't go back to those more than maybe just this one time. I don't want to put too much highlight on some of these areas because I really want them to be the, um, not really be the focus, I should say, of the, of the highlights. I want the upper half of the model to really show, hey, that's a, a bright green with a lot of transitions. It looks like I put a lot of work into it and did all these blends when really I just spent 20 minutes using some oils. I'm going to let the rest of the video run for a few minutes with you being able to see the process in its entirety and no jump cuts or here's the finished model. Once I get closer to finishing with the green highlights, I'll begin again.
Now I've taken mostly pure buff and mixed into just that slight mix of the green in the buff that I was working with, and essentially I'm creating my extreme highlight. Now you can do this with a smaller brush if you wish, but I'm just going to continue using this larger brush. And now I'm picking out those just real, like, most extreme areas, those 90 degree angles on the missile boxes, the very tops of the omnipods on the arms. I really just want that, that wet pigment to hit those edges and that's it, at least initially. I don't want to try to smear it around or, or smooth it out or anything right now. I want to hit those outer edges and then assess on how it looks. If you want to do this with a smaller brush, like I said, you can apply it with a smaller brush. You can, uh, you can use a very tiny detail brush and apply it to the edges like you would an edge highlight and then you can smooth it out with a slightly larger brush. There's a lot of different methods to go about getting the blends the way you want them to look, but I'm just doing this with kind of a one-stop, everything's done all at once type of thing just because I think it's easier than me going back and forth with a bunch of brushes and trying to show you too much uh, too quickly. The paint that's already on with, with the previous applications will have started to cure just in the few minutes that I've, I've had it on there, but by no means is it dry, so it will blend, it will smooth. Keep that in mind, that can also work against you, but it, for the most part, as long as you're using a light touch and, and following the, the flow of the, the highlights towards the brightest areas and working out darker to light in this case, then it's going to do what you want it to do and work more with you than against you. You can see I just want to stipple and catch those highest areas. This will prevent any need for me to come back and do any sort of you know, extreme highlight overall. I, I could still do that afterwards, but I'm going to get a similar effect without anywhere near as much time spent doing the actual work. I also like the idea that it looks a little bit more natural because there's not such a sharp edge that's highlighted and then it moves on to something else. It kind of all blends and merges together. It's a, it's a style thing, so if it's not your style, you know, adapt it to your own. But for me, I just I enjoyed the way this was starting to turn out and look, so I kind of just left it alone. If you find that you've gone maybe a little too far in comparison to some of the other areas as you're working, oh, maybe one arm got a little too bright, you know you can always go back and add just a touch of that green back into that mid-tone and work that in ever so slightly. You could also switch brushes to a uh, brush they haven't used or it looks clean and try maybe just blending it out a little bit more, pulling that paint out towards those highlights and that might pick up some of the darker tones that you have sitting in those middle areas and that might actually achieve the results that you want. Now I'm just hitting those last little bits of areas. I'm not really doing too much to them. I don't want to overwork the paint. I don't want because the, the more I push it around, the more I'm integrating those lighter and lighter colors. And I want there to be a visible and noticeable transition. So there is a, a point where you kind of have to, hey, I can't really stretch and push the paint this far, or I can't start in this one area and move out, otherwise I'm going to lose a lot of the contrast and shaded areas in the transition. You can see now there's quite a, a drastic difference from where we began. I'm just checking the paint on my brush because I might want to just do a little bit more. The light's going to kind of look different than it will in person. Because of the oils, they have a, a sheen to them. They're a, kind of a satin appearance, but the overall assessment is obviously yours to make. And here I'm just looking at a couple of these areas that I think ended up too bright. So I went and took a little bit of that olive green and kind of put it on the bottom of these outer arm panels just to add a little bit of a darker lower side transition to them. Of course, you can do this as little as much as you want. If you want to be more accurate, of course, again, use a smaller brush, or you can just leave it alone. It's, uh, it's completely up to you. As I mentioned before, I was going to show you how to clean up any areas you may want to fix or remove some paint from. So find the area that you're wanting to clean up and be aware that you put odorless mineral spirits on these oils, you're going to reactivate them. So like I had said, I have some heavy pigment area on the upper leg if I want to remove it. Here's my artist grade white spirit. Make sure you get artist grade, not the stuff you get from the hardware store. 
I've got some synthetic and regular cotton swabs that I could use. You could apply it on the swab, you can apply it with a brush, but as soon as you put it on there, it's going to start to flow much more like a wash would, so use a little amount. I like to use a jar with a lid to minimize my exposure to the fumes, and that's why it is important to get the artist grade. It does have much less fumes. Even though it says odorless, it still does have some fumes, even though you can't smell them. And some people may be sensitive to the fumes, so make sure you work in an area with good ventilation. When I finish with the oils, I usually let them cure for at least 12 to 24 hours. Then I spray my clear coat gloss enamel over the top and let that cure per the instructions. You can see here is a before and after with the oils cured as well as the clear coat over the top. With my clear coat completely dry, I'm going to move on to details. I've got my charcoal gray and I'm also going to use my gunmetal gray. I'll have them both out on my palette at the same time because I'm not going to do too many areas. I really want the focus of this paint job to be the greens and the browns, plus the artwork doesn't have a whole lot of those on there anyway. I'll start with the metallics and I'm just going to hit the jump jet ports and exhaust vents. Anything I want to be shiny, obviously. I'm not too concerned with these details as far as taking a whole lot of time on them, so it's just gonna be a basic silver and then a wash over the top of it. And the same thing with the charcoal gray. It'll be an application and then probably just a little bit of highlighting. Don't get too wrapped up into the details. Be careful with them, of course. If you make a mistake, because you have the clear coat on there, you can use a toothpick even to kind of push back some of the paint and if it gets into an area you don't want. You can also use a bit of uh, alcohol as well if you need to clean up an area. It won't penetrate the enamel as long as you have a good clear coat on there, which is a nice benefit. So if you wanted to do, say, stripes or checkers, which is in a different video, then of course that would be a nice benefit to having used that enamel clear coat. Once I'm done with the metallics, I'll jump over to the charcoal. I'm just gonna pick out these weapon barrels real quick. There's not too many of them, and I just wanted something a little bit different to stand out in the contrast to the light green. Now with those details done, you can see I've actually started working on a little bit of the jeweling while I was waiting for some of these other elements to dry. Those are in different videos and not the focus of this tutorial. But you can see how having the contrasted areas, the shaded vents, reinforcing some of the recesses with some uh, wash while you're working, all of those things are to your preference, but it's a great time to do that after you've done that clear enamel. So now I'm gonna take this Army Painter Dark Tone. I know I didn't mention that in the video at the beginning of the materials we used. You can use whatever black wash you want, and I'm just putting a simple black wash layer over all the metallics. I just wanna put a little bit of darker tint to them, get the recesses to have a little bit of a black shadow, and any of the holes and dark deep recesses to really be reinforced. That's all I'm doing with this. It's really quick. I'm not gonna take too much time with it. Again, I just wanna reinforce the metallics and the shadows so that there's some contrast to the brighter greens and browns. All right, you can see the miniature has definitely progressed without you seeing what's going on. I grabbed my earth tone of uh, paint and my small cell foam. You can find these in blister packs and things like that. And now I'm just gonna sponge dab onto the finished areas because I've added my decals and my checkers and all those other things, all the elements of the miniature are essentially done. You don't wanna weather before those things because they'll look odd over the top of some weathering. So you really need to be essentially done with the miniature. Don't worry, a lot of those things are in other videos that you can find on Camo Specs YouTube channel. So now I'm working with this, this sponge. Now you can see I'm having a hard time getting in between different areas and I'm kind of fighting it. Now if the miniature was still on a hex base, I'd be kind of, my hands would be tied. So that's what the tweezers are for. So you can grab the same sponge, you can get locking tweezers, you can get the ones that I have. And this really, I've found, makes a big difference in getting into tighter areas. I really don't want to have the, the dabbed paint all over the entire miniature. I want it to be kind of on a lower side so that it looks more realistic, like the dirt and the mud has been kicked up, but it's not going all the way up the entire miniature. I do have other videos that talk about how to weather with sponges to do chipped paint effects and more of an entirety of the miniature. And it's a very similar process, but because again, I'm trying to mimic the artwork and get that dirty, dusty, worn lower leg areas that's my primary focus with this whole process 
So I'm, I'm again, up, put paint onto the sponge, dab most of it off onto the paper towel. The foam you're using may have different properties and what I'm using, you just have to test it out. And again, you can test it out on a base. I could test it out on the little piece of cork that I have with a miniature attached to, to see how the paint uh, is applying in the patterns and so on and so forth. So you may need to fold the foam over in a different angle to kind of get a bit more random spatter. Uh, you can also use a brush. You could use a stippling brush for this. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to use a sponge if you're more comfortable with that. There's nothing wrong with that. You could also painstakingly paint all of this on there with a small brush like some of those really famous painters do. I'm not one of them. So I'm just going to cheat and do this quickly and just make it look worn and, and feel good about myself later because I didn't spend a whole day doing it. This is completely optional. It's also a personal preference on how far you wanna take this. So whatever your narrative is in your mind with your miniature, go for it. Again, if you have that clear coat over the top of your miniature and you aren't doing stuff over checkers like I am at least, you can probably wipe some of it away if you get a little too much. If you have a damp Q-tip or a, a moistened brush, you can work some of that paint back if you make a mistake. So I always try to let everyone know the things that you can undo if you're prepared and quick enough about them because it's not any fun to have to deal with fixing something after you think you've got it taken care of or it's you know past the point of being able to do something and you could have done it immediately. So I like to let a little bit of this paint get up onto the details. You probably think I'm crazy for putting them over the checkers, but you know, I'm trying to make it look interesting and realistic. And I'm putting over the decals as well. I don't, don't hold back on that. Uh, it is a good idea to put a little bit of a protective coat over those decals as well. You can have some flaking. I actually did have some on this miniature that you didn't see, but I fixed it. Uh, so bad on me, but Hey, learn from my mistakes. Now I move on to a khaki. And again, I probably didn't mention that, but now I've got a round, my round makeup brush. This is a bigger version of the one that I use for the oils, but I'm using it for acrylics. And this is the same one I used in the first video to dry brush. It is a, a really awesome brush to use for dry brushing, I found. And now I'm getting a lot of that paint off. And now it's time to, I guess, dust up the lower legs or take that earth colors, those what maybe would have been considered mud and turn it into dried caked dust or kicked up dust and that's the effect i'm going for with this and again i'm going over the decals i'm going over the checkers i'm taking it up as high as i feel is appropriate for the miniature again you work with your own personal preference on what you think looks good don't need a whole lot of pigment don't need a whole lot of paint i'm just trying to add just a little bit of difference in the two browns so that it looks like it's been through a battle or walked through a bunch of dirt and dust. I'll let's go for a few minutes so you can see the entire process and once it's done I'll show you the finished result. So now I've grabbed that sky gray and a smaller dry brush. And now it's time to add just a little bit of highlight to the charcoal areas. 
I know this is a very minor step, but I didn't want to forget about them. I'm not drying the paint too much. I actually am kind of almost overbrushing because I want that gray transition to the darker gray, but I'm being very, very light to the touch. You could also have done this with oils, really. You could have done the black and then put oils over it. You can wet blend it, you could glaze it, you could just edge highlight it, you could true dry brush it, whatever you feel like doing. But I didn't want to forget those two things, otherwise it would look weird next to the highlighted areas of the weapons pods. And here you have the finished results. As you can see, for the amount of effort that was put into it, I feel that it turned out really, really well. The end credits will have links to part one of this video, as well as to others showing how I accomplished some of the detailing on this model that weren't shown here. Thanks for watching. Send us off, Tex. We certainly hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and leave your questions or comments below. Follow us on Facebook at Battletech Camo Specs Online. Check out our website at camospecs.com. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Heat critical. Shutdown imminent. Time for Pop-Tarts.